Welcome to the Salk Institute's Where Cures Begin podcast, where scientists talk about breakthrough discoveries with your hosts, Ali Akmal and Brittany Fair. Dr. Marga Behrens is a research professor in Salk's Computational Neurobiology Laboratory. As a neurobiologist, she studies the interplay between genes and environmental influences to determine why some people develop conditions such as bipolar disorder, depression, schizophrenia, or autism. Dr. Marga Behrens, welcome to Where Cures Begin. Well, thank you for having me here. So you study the brain circuits in the prefrontal cortex, which is an area of the brain responsible for decision-making and reasoning. What is interesting of the prefrontal cortex is the brain region that develops slower. Mm -hmm. So in humans, for example, it doesn't reach maturity until 25 years of age. You really need a long process. Even in, in animals, this region of the brain has a slow maturational process. When people talk about development, they usually talk about the very early stages, when neurons are produced, etc. Okay. That occurs in the embryonic phase. In what I call maturation mm -hmm. is once those neurons become neurons, they go through a very slow process to become what they are in your brain. So they come up as cells that are quite defined in what they are, but they haven't made the connections they need. Okay. They have a long way to go, almost like any human being. You know, you have a kid, all it does is open the eyes, cry, poop and sleep <laughs> uh -huh. and then slowly it starts reacting so that is the process of the maturation of your brain and the neurons that conform it and so in, in humans there is a, a sprout of a connectivity quite high up until the two years of age so if you look at a brain, it looks as if like it's growing like crazy. And then it starts a very sharp pruning of connections that are not useful and uh, cells that are not engaged mm -hmm. in any network and those ones die. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the 99% of the neurons you have in your brain now, you were born with them. Oh, wow. Okay. And you were born with more neurons than you have now. You keep on killing them uh -huh. slowly. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> but you, you get a, a, a pretty rich dowry. And so the reason why this region of the brain is so interesting is because, in a sense, it's sort of the, the central command, and it receives inputs from almost all other regions in the brain, mm -hmm. and it sends outputs to a lot of the different brain regions okay and is the one that takes all inputs from your own body mm -hmm. and it allows you to make a decision and so whenever you find an alteration in this brain region mm -hmm. usually your decision making is sort of off and that's happening in the prefrontal cortex and that the prefrontal cortex is is the hub okay for this mm -hmm. uh, is involved in mentalizing, in decision on given a situation, you have inputs, perceptual inputs, and your own state, and it makes you take a decision towards moving, towards doing a thing. So it very strong connections with motor cortex, for example, to run away. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so all that part is sort of a hub of decision, which is what basically keeps us alive. So it might be helping determine you're, you're at a street corner and you're trying to decide whether to cross the street and you're evaluating all of the traffic exactly. and the lights and everything. Exactly. And so the brain, in a sense, is a machine that allows you to perceive the world and keep yourself alive. Why is so important to me is because usually the workings of that brain region is altered in mental disorder. 
Mm -hmm. Subtle changes won't affect evolution. The species won't disappear because of that. But the social part of that working of the brain is altered. I, I make the difference between mental illness and neurological disorders where there is a very strong alteration in pathways that you can see in an MRI or ah, things like okay. that. But that is a very different situation. For example, in Down syndrome, you have strong alterations. But in mental disorders, you cannot observe. It's the workings that you observe are altered. The reactions towards a certain uh, situation. How did you get interested in this field? How did I get interested in neurosciences? Because while I was in college, I did a university in Chile. And there I had the opportunity, if you want, to interact with schizophrenia patients. And it just marveled. Really? What? is going on? Why is this person talking to me totally normal and then suddenly is totally off? You know, the same fact is taken in a different way and build up a, a whole world parallel that you say, what are you seeing? Why do you... And that thought disorder to me was fascinating. So as a neuroscientist, you're not looking at people's behavior. You're looking at the brain function and the brain structure and that sort of thing. So how do you find these subtle differences? How do you see them? So one of the things that started me on this was I started working on the effects of ketamine in the brain. And that's a drug? It's a dissociative anesthetic that is a analog of fencyclidine. Both, both those drugs were designer drugs, anesthetics. You know, they were designed for that. But one of the things that they uh, discovered was that they were prosychotic. So when you give them to a, a normal person, they do produce the dissociation, but they give a psychotic state. And so I was trying to understand the workings of uh, that drug, and we discovered that it produced a, sort of a long-lasting effects. We are talking always mice. Okay. Okay, which is what we can control in the adult mice. And those effects would last about a week, and then the system would recover and produce a state that was similar to the psychotic episode, that schizophrenia in person. humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in studying this, I realized that, well, you can produce a psychotic state, but the animal doesn't remain psychotic as, for example, a schizophrenic person is. Ah, uh -huh. And so I said, well, this is affecting a very major cell type in the brain. And when does this happen? And can we produce a state that is permanent? And so that's how I went back towards the early on to see when these neurons become active, when they start uh, producing their connections. And that's what brought me to the early perinatal period. Because during that phase, which correspond to the second, third trimester in humans. Behrens explains that mice are born less developed than humans. So by studying how mice brains are developing shortly after birth, we can better understand how human brains are developing shortly before birth. But looking at that period was that we started looking at what are the rules that command the way this system is maturing. And that brought us to what are the genetic networks that guide the maturation of these neurons. And that is what brought us to the epigenome, which is what I study. 
Epigenome literally means above the genome. It's the pattern of chemical tags attached to DNA that control when genes are active. They're like post-its that say, turn this gene on or leave this gene off. Although our genome doesn't change during our life, our epigenome does. And scientists are finding that studying how these patterns change over time can be very useful for understanding, for example, how we age or how a disease develops. So it is sort of, we went from the behavior to the brain networks, to the neurons, to the molecular signatures that are commanding how these neurons develop and how they acquire their identity. Nowadays, we know that the, each neuron has an epigenetic pattern that is its own. And so it's so defining that we are now mapping the whole brain based on those patterns. Wow. And those patterns are dynamic as the animal is maturing up until adolescence. And so all those changes allow you to understand, okay, there are a lot of things happening that lead to these neurons in this region of the brain to behave the way they do. Not only are neuroscientists like Barron's mapping epigenetic patterns overall, but they are looking at which specific genes are turned on or off. Because those genes make proteins that help neurons and other brain cells function. So the researchers can use molecular tools to turn specific genes on or off in a neuron and see how the neuron's activity changes, or how it connects to other neurons across junctions called synapses. So you go one step at a time, and then you say, okay, you have alterations in this protein. That Does that lead to alteration in the type of connection the neuron does? you look at synapses and then you say okay these synapses are altered can we go a step further and see how the working of that neuron is affected because sometimes a change in a protein doesn't lead to a change in the electrical pattern of a neuron so you go and do electrophysiology and then you see alteration in electrophysiology does this lead to an alteration in the system, you go do EEG to analyze how the brain is working. And then you finally go, does this affect behavior? Does this lead to an alteration in the way the animal is perceiving its surrounding, is reacting to it? And that's how you do behavior. So you go from a behavioral output that you see, and you go, walk back, not always is successful. We can usually get lost in the middle, but, uh -huh. <laughs> but in general, that is the way. And from there is that we, we know in mostly autism and schizophrenia, which is what I try to study, we have certain characteristic alterations in behavior and a lot of knowledge of the workings of the connectivity patterns. So you're able to notice behavioral details about somebody with schizophrenia and then connect those back to actual changes in the brain patterns or the epigenetics of yes, their Yes, that's what cells. we are trying to do. How did you get interested in science? Well, there was a... How would you say it? My, both my parents were scientists, uh, so uh -huh. it was the default uh -huh. thing. I was going to be an architect. I did really? two years of architecture uh -huh. and then decided, no, it's, and went into science. Was that because you were rebelling against the influence of your parents? No, no, because I love it. Ah. I, and I still love it. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there were two loves uh -huh. and I had to incline myself for one and... And I decided that the challenges of science were more exciting. The excitement of uh, doing science is, is bigger. Bigger questions, maybe? Bigger question, And it's, it's the excitement of, I don't know, do you like solving puzzles? Yes. It's that. 
So what advice would you give to people who are thinking about a career in science or interested in potentially pursuing science? In general, the advice that I give to the students that come around is, you won't like it, but is, this is a priesthood. You really need to love it because the setbacks are nine out of 10. It requires an enormous amount of work and resilience because you become emotional, you know? You, you have an idea and fortunately you end up loving your idea uh -huh. and then the facts are telling you you are wrong uh -huh. and you have to accept that you are wrong. Think about it. Think whether you want to keep learning the rest of your life, just like a student, and whether you want to get up at three in the morning and go to the lab because you have an experiment that is running and you. So it's, it's, it's a commitment. Yeah. It's a, it's a true commitment. So in young people, in mostly the students that I get from UCSD, I always tell them that you, you need an enormous amount of passion. Because if not, it's, nobody likes torturing themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds also like, you know, I've heard that resilience and grit is something that can be learned. So you don't have to think, am I naturally resilient? You can learn to be more resilient, yeah. right? So no, of course, passion. yes. Of course, yes. But there, you have to have the drive. Uh -huh. If not, it's, you know, you learn resilience. Yes. yes. What for? To me, is the, the drive to keep going. The curiosity and the interest in finding answers. Exactly. Well, it seems like the way you're going at problems, you see a behavior like the behaviors of schizophrenia, and then you're going backwards in mice to cells and then networks of cells and then epigenetic patterns. That's the work of a lifetime. Yeah. Because there's so many brain cells and it's so complex. <laughs> But I am a person that believes, strongly believes, science is a teamwork. For example, I would ban the Nobel Prize, uh. totally ban it, because that prize is the individual, and science is, is a teamwork. And so, as you have seen, I don't work alone. I don't try to learn everything myself. It's, Okay, we have a problem. Which are experts in each of their fields that can help to look at this problem? And so I team up with everybody because I have a question or because they have a question. And so that is one of the nicest parts of our work, the ability to team up, to go after a question. Yeah. And that, I think, if we did that more, it would be much more successful and entertaining. And entertaining also. <laughs> yes. To be part of a team, a collaborative team. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, where, it, it, think of it, any situation, you have to do something. If you have a partner, a pal, a buddy, it makes it way more interesting. I always say, it's like, humans are the only species that make the same mistake twice. Uh -huh. Not even donkeys do oh. <laughs> make the same mistake twice. <laughs> we tend to do it a lot. <laughs> and so when you have a team working all together, it's more difficult to, you know, stumble into the same mistake twice. And it brings the fresh point of view, which is, for example, one of the things that I tell little kids is, don't be afraid. Ask the question. If not, you're not going to have the answer. And it's just, might be, might sound silly, but you don't understand it. So keep on asking until you do. And in this case, it's the same. We are grown ups, etc. but never stop asking questions. Never believe something until you understand it deeply. My daughter used to come with me to the lab. And one day she asked me to look, she was about six, to look through the microscope. And so I put her a plate with neurons. And so she was looking through the microscope. 
didn't say much. And on our way back home, sitting in the back seat of the car, she says, no, mom, how did you manage to put all those mosquitoes in those little wells? <laughs> <laughs> and, I said, and I said, those are not mosquitoes. Those are neurons, the cells of your brain. And she says, oh, come on. Are you telling me that our head is full of mosquitoes now? <laughs> Don't accept things as a fact without really deeply agreeing. And be prepared is a fight. Science in general, it's, you know, your ideas are always being challenged. Ideas being challenged is the basis of science. We need it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's my late husband used to say, it's a well-considered guess. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and so if other people get to the same well-considered guess, mm -hmm. it starts making sort of sense that, oh, it might be true. But you have to be always aware that the way you look at things, you have an intrinsic bias in the way you look at a fact. And sometimes you're wrong. Many times. But be open-minded to that. Don't marry to your idea. Because somebody will come and say, well, you didn't look at it from this angle. And it turns out that it's not that way. Because in the end, the truth will come out. I like it. It seems like a good place to end. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a fascinating conversation. And I look forward to hearing more about what you're discovering. Well, it, as always, it has been a lot of fun chatting with you, although I chat more than you. <laughs> <laughs> you have more interesting things to say. No, no. I bet you have to. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. very much. <laughs>